Okay, good. Um, well, I'm very happy to introduce Yusuf Barish Kartal from Princeton, who's going to tell us about iterates of symplectomorphisms and p attic analytic actions. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Nate, for the, thanks for the invitation and introduction. Um, so yeah, so as Nate said, this is about you know how to use basic p attic analysis to uh, you know to say something about say something about growth of fuller homology groups under iterations of symplectomorphisms. So let me start by writing the guiding question here. So, okay, let's, this be a symplectic. It's a symplectic manifold and say, why is this symplectomorphism? So the question is, how does flow homology change or grow or you can ask several questions. Okay. So the theorem that I'm going to talk about today is related to this is something that tells you is something that tells you that you know the ranks of this groups will be bounded under certain assumptions. Let me just state the theorem. Okay, so assume M omega is monotone or negatively monotone. The examples I have are negatively monotone actually. And well, satisfying some other assumptions like non-degeneracy. I, I wrote something like strongly non-degenerate doesn't mean anything. It just means there are a bunch of other assumptions. Um, and phi is some symptomorphism, but it's isotopic to identity. So I will use flare homology with Novikov coefficients. Um, okay, to make sense. And let's L and L prime be you know, nice Lagrangians with some extra structures. So they define, you know, their flare homology is well defined, they define objects of Foucault category, etc. Then HF is a dimension of, I wrote rank, but the same thing. And this rank is, sorry. Constant. In K with finitely many possible exceptions. So before, uh, before I start talking about um, the assumptions, let me just give a couple of examples. The simplest example is probably a genus two surface. Okay. And let's say this is your L, this is your L prime and Say you have a symplectic isotopy and assume that it's the time one um, that's called it's the time one map of this isotope phi is this time one map of this isotopy then flow homology is well let's just see Oops. 
It is zero unless k equals one. Okay. Oops. Another example. Well, still take a genus two surface. And let's say I take three meridians, C, C prime, C prime prime. The cheap version is, you know, you have an isotopy, phi t, then assume phi of c is c prime, and phi of, c, phi square of c is c prime prime, and the cheap version is you take l to be c and l prime to be Two folks. Yeah, so the problem with using it vertically is then everything goes off the screen very fast. Feel free to swap if you're more comfortable with portrait. Mm. That's okay. If you want to see more of what I had written just three minutes ago, tell me to swap it. Otherwise, I, I will remember what I wrote. Um, the less cheap version is. This one, um, let's say M is sigma two cross sigma two and I want to take another curve here. Actually, I want to swap this. It makes screen something better. Is this good or? Yeah, that looks that looks fine. Um, before, I think you had that top thing hidden, but it doesn't matter too much. That's okay. I'm happy with this. Okay, so okay, so let's say M is the product, and. L is, let's call this other Lagrangian, other curve L. I could take L to be, you know, L cross C, union C cross L, but they intersect at one point. So just take this to be a cone of this folks. And you can also, you know, apply a surgery to get some genuine Lagrangian here. And let's say L prime is C prime cross C prime prime. So this is an example after checking non-degeneracy. I haven't done that. Probably somebody did at some point or somebody who. Um, but, and phi is, as you can guess, I one cross phi one. So it's fuller homology group here. It's in a long exact sequence. I will be a little sloppy and we'll just write HF y to the K. We'll just write this as a cone. Okay, so that's tricky. HF Phi to the K, C cross L, C prime, C prime prime. Okay, that's not good. 
Is this visible here? It's getting small. It, sort of, but it's a little bit small. Yeah, I will fix the writing issues in a second. So let's just finish this example and then I will expand everything. Okay, so L cross C, uh, you know, L always intersects C prime here, but C intersects C prime prime at two, right? So this is non-zero for K equals two. It may intersect at other points too, but it may, it will have vanishing flow homology. And this is not zero when K equals one. So this thing is not zero when K equals one and two. So it's, you know, this first part is not zero only at K equals two. The second is only at K equals one. And hence, you know, you have this, you have non-vanishing of this guy here, only at k equals one and two. And you can use a similar idea to cook up more uh, complicated examples. And presumably you can also consider the images of these guys in the symmetric product. That's actually how I first came up with this. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah, I wanted to ask, is it going to be clear to us why this fails in the Kalabiao case? I will give an example. Well, I mean, the example I know, but like in the proof. Yes, it will be very clear. Okay. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay. The assumptions. So I had to expand the screen a little bit because I was unable to do anything. So you know, just let me know if you wanna see something in the back. And I think that's the size I will keep it towards at, until the end of the talk. So the first assumption is M is non-degenerate. So maybe a little small. So, you don't really need to know what this means. It just implies that Foucault category is smooth. And second condition is M is generated by, you know, Bohr, Sommerfeld, monotone, Lagrangians, L1 through L M. You don't really need to remember uh, the number of those allies. Finitely many or some of that monotone Lagrangians. So I won't explain this assumption. It you know it depends on the choice of some data, like some pre-quantum bundle plus something else. But let me just say that this is a condition. that ensures the count of holomorphic disks with fixed boundary conditions. Of zero dimensional count, of course. Conditions like on LI, of course. are finite. In other words, the coefficients of a infinite structure, a floor differential and product and higher multi multiplications are you know, finite sums. Okay. And this is not, I mean, yeah. So that's basically why you, it cannot hold in the Kalabiyao case. You don't really have this problem. But you will see from the construction that you can just get around this problem by just, you know, assuming, you know by just testing some complete string. We will always, yeah, 
let me not say anything else. And this condition is not incredibly strong. You know, if you have finitely many generators, uh, so that the first cohomology of M maps surjectively into first cohomology of Li's, then you can weaken this condition a little bit, or you can just rescale your symplectic form. And that would ensure that there is at least one representative in the isotopic class of Li that satisfies bohr sommerfeld monotone condition. So this is the crucial property. And the non-example is, well, it's pretty simple. Let's just take an elliptic curve. Let's say, I take two curves that are two pi over three apart from each other. And say, this is like two pi over three. And the floor homology here is non-zero if and only if k is one mod three. So it's periodic. Um, so I believe that you know in the Calabria, in, in this case, for instance, the periodic statement still holds, but not constant. Okay, let me tell the motivation. The motivation is theorem of Bell. This is what I think motivated Paul. My motivation is his motivation or something like this. I learned this from him. So let's say you have a complex affine variety or any affine variety over characteristic zero or over a field of characteristic zero. Sub variety a point inside or outside the sub variety and an automorphism. Okay. So consider the set of natural numbers. So that Kate iterate uh, of phi moves x into the variety. Okay, so this is a subset. Then what Bell proves is that this set is a finite union of finite mean arithmetic progressions. Finite mean. Maybe I should have. Sorry. See. Union of finitely many arithmetic progressions up to addition and subtraction of finitely many points. In other words, and finitely many other numbers. Okay. So that's the motivating uh, statement. And this guy with some other folks, there's another, another version for coherent sheaves. Some, some, I, yeah, I should have checked this, but Satriano, Bell, yeah, I forgot the other one. Could be two care, but really not sure. It's really not just two, but. They have a version that doesn't always work, but works in special cases that, uh, you know, that gives a description of the set of natural numbers of that the local tor So this is Kate iterate of the pullback of phi, and you're looking into, you know, iterates of phi so that this tall group does not vanish. So it's a, it's a subset of N and they have a version for this subset. 
doesn't hold all, all the time. And same property sometimes. And it's really not for affine varieties. It's for in some cases for surfaces. It's, there are also some other cases. And Barif, you have a question from Mohammed Abu Zaid. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to know, is there a version with automorphisms of the derived category rather than automorphisms of the variety? No, no. Paul uh, slides state a version for line bundles. But okay, I, okay, yeah, like tensoring with line bundles, okay. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there can be a version for automorphisms of derived category. Okay. And, and the last thing I was going to say is you, your, your uh, theorem had like, uh, um, connected component assumption. So these things, of course, suggest that maybe that can be dropped. Uh, yes and no. I think I think the statement doesn't hold in general. Like pseudonymous of maps, for instance, should give a counter examples. I see. Okay, got it. But you know, it's really some you know work for. Like I, I, I'm thinking on related questions. I think, for instance, if you put an entropy bound, then categorical entropy, and a bound on the categorical height, then I think you may get some similar results. Thank you. And Barish, I, 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 oh, go ahead. Sorry. You go ahead, Jill. I, I just had one other naive question about your non-example right before the Bell's theorem of the torus with this two pi over three rotation. Sure. Um, so, uh, so this example suggests like some very naive way of constructing other non-examples by like finding some periodic symplectomorphism, um, you know, that uh, that's isotopic to the identity. And um, um, is, is there is it is it presumably the case that in the examples you consider there's some topological obstruction to the existence of such, you know, easy non-examples, or or does your theorem imply, I mean, uh, you know, in particular imply the non-existence of such things? You know, if you have some element of simpnat that's periodic, but that has, that's non-trivial, right? Then I think I think if it's non-trivial, then you would be able to produce non-zero elements of the flux group, which doesn't okay. exist in the monotone case. There, there we go. Thanks. That's that's great. Thanks. And I was wondering, uh, is there a version of Bell's theorem? that has a conclusion similar to your theorem where um, where there would be like only finitely many um, Ks, yeah. like when X is Fano or something? I don't know that. I mean, oh. unfortunately, I don't know that. So Bell's theorem holds in bigger generality though. It's like for any automorphisms is, is Muhammad also noticed, I think. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's in a sense a lot stronger. Maybe if you can even if you confine to out nuts, maybe for affine varieties, but in out nuts, but that's really not okay. So this is motivated Paul to ask the following question. He states this as a conjecture. We can see the slides iterates of something something in his web page. So basically this asking if there's a symplectic version. For instance, does the set, mm, K, such that this folks, are, this is just, you know, fuller theoretical isomorphism, quite categorical isomorphism. Satisfy a similar property. He states this actually for, you know, up to, up to twist by line bundles, but, you know, that was also my main, my first motivation was his conjecture. Um, let me not make this remark, let me not write this. So, you know, my theorem is somehow weaker because it requires monotonicity, it requires being isotopic to identity, but it's also stronger in the sense that, you know, this constancy uh, with finite many exception holds. So let me just sketch Bell's argument. So 
it's going to be vaguely related. So assume, you know, the variety, the sub variety, the automorphism, the points, they're all defined. Over a finitely generated extension of Q that lives inside C. You can always find such a you know field extension just because everything that defines these objects, there are only finite many complex numbers that define all these objects. as well as inverse of phi. Sorry, I get confused. It's finitely generated. Okay, do step one. You, he embeds K into QP, PX, or some P. I mean, this holds for infinitely many primes, but in his case, it doesn't hold for every prime. You can easily, you know, find finitely generate field extensions that you cannot embed into Q3, for instance. And in our case, embedding is a lot easier. Uh, step two is that's why Bell has, you know, finitely many arithmetic progressions instead of being constant with finite many exceptions. For some um, M, there exist periodic arcs interpolating let me put in quotation marks. You know, the iterates of x under phi to the m. And I can't remember if Bell actually said this for automorphisms, but he does this for every point. So actually, let's, let me just write in this way. Okay. So, you know, you may not interpolate the whole orbit of x by a periodic arc, but you can interpolate it by uh, m periodic arcs. Picture is like this. You have x, you have phi of x. No, nope, nope, nope. Ah, yeah. Phi to the mx, phi to two mx. You have phi x, phi to the m plus one x. Phi to the two m plus one x. That, 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 and uh, Last one here is this guy. Yeah, if I remember correctly, in this case, this M is actually P minus one, but that's not going to be necessary for us. Let's see. Okay. So by periodic arc, I mean, you know, some map from the periodic unit disk to x or extension of x to the PX. And then as you, your intuition from complex analysis can tell you, since it's PX, it's it, you know, theorem with some name, it's called Strassmann's theorem, that states that an analytic arc Let's just say parameterized by unit disk. Uh, so if an analytic arc parameterized by unit disk intersects y at infinitely many points, then it is in y. Um, so this is like if y is in hypersurface, right? Defined by a 
polynomial polynomial f that is basically telling that if a polynomial vanishes you know, if you have analytic function induced analytic function vanishes on a periodic arc or on a you know on a on a periodic unit disk then it vanishes and it you know identically so this implies all these arcs are either in y or intersect at finitely many points. I'm a little behind, okay. So our method is analogous. I will construct periodic arcs interpolating, let's say, the action of the symplectomorphism on the Foucault category. Before saying anything periodic though, let me just review, or let me just tell you how to construct local analytic action on Foucault category. So let me tell you more about the formal setting. Let's see these guys are or Sommerfeld, monotone, Lagrangians, and assume they generate Foucault category. Okay. So this is their span. It's an A infinity category. spend by li and it's the category over the Novikov field with rational coefficients but real exponents and you know a infinite structure is, is usual You will weight each disk with the energy, T to the energy, where T is the Novikov parameter. Okay. So to continue introducing the setting without loss of generality, assume phi is time bound flow. Since I'm interested in this action of quite category, I can assume this is time and flow of a symplectic isotopy generated by a time independent closed one form. And, um, and you get a you get a symplectic isotopy generated by the corresponding symplectic vector field. My convention is to put this into second slot. Okay. And using these folks, okay, I'm being sloppy here, but you can construct family. So this is a family of symplectomorphisms. As you can think of the action of a symplectomorphism on the Foucault category is a bimodule. By modules on here, deforming the identity, uh, deforming the diagonal. So the construction is, you know, is at t equals zero. Let's say t equals zero. It's just a diagonal by module. Okay. Let me. Right in an annoying way for the moment. So you know, I'm assuming these folks are transfers, etc. So it's just span of these folks, and diagonal by module has structure maps given by 
you know, it's the same structure maps of the A infinity structure. Right, plus minus T to the energy. Again, count curves. That's just a diagonal bimodule. And to define other folks here, I will confine myself to, you know, let, let, let me not say it now. Okay. So often I will write this as just restriction to small t and I will ignore this capital T here because I'm black boxing something that makes this expression a little useless. Okay, it's defined almost in the same way. Except now you will actually weight the disks a bit differently. This is yeah, quite a trick. Let me leave a gap here. Okay, so far it's just a diagonal, but now you will add this other term here, t to the t alpha partial hu. So partial hu is basically, I think I like thinking of it as the class of this line inside the disk, but I'm gonna give a better definition in a second. And alpha is the one form. So, you know, to define partial HU, you fix a base point here, let's say, in the manifold, and you fix homotopy classes of paths. And you concatenate them all. So, this is a class inside the first homology mod torsion. And why do I do something weird like this? Let's just state with, let's just start with a lemma that tells you that this has some geometric meaning for small t. Is geometric. Hmm. For small t, i.e., corresponds to action of phi alpha to the t. Okay, this is still not incredibly precise. More precisely, something that lets you say something about things you already know. Okay, I didn't include H in the Fukai category, oh, sorry, L in the Fukai category. You know, L is just another Lagrangian. But I can add it to the Fukai category and define a Yoneda, right, Yoneda module, okay? And the bimodules are somehow more the transformations, right? They are giving you transformations on the category of modules by convolution, by this tensor product here. So the claim is that this works the way you would expect when t is small. And hopefully I will be able to show that this holds for some other T when T is even large. Rish, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so I was not understanding, is phi T directly involved in the definition of the bimodule? Uh, is it involved? So yeah, so I am assuming without loss of generality that phi is the of 
this isotopy generated by alpha. And when you are defining the bimodule, this red term here uh, couples this first cohomology class, first homology class with alpha. Do you see my cursor actually? Maybe. Yeah. Okay. okay. Here. And, and so, then what does the squiggly line on the disk mean? So the squiggly line means it's just the homotopy class of the path that goes from X to Y. I see, okay. And to, be, to, make, it, to make this class uh, defined rigorously, I pick a base point in the manifold and choose path from this point, this base point to the generators of M and just concatenate them all so that I get a loop. So, if you want, you can think of the squiggly line as a non-squiggly line, so that it's like you know, it's like a kilted strip, right? You um, put the graph of the, you normally put the graph of a symplectomorphism uh, in the place of kilt to define the corresponding bimodule, right? But when your symplectomorphism is isotopic to identity, so that when your graph is Lagrangian isotopic to diagonal, you can just use, you know. Fukaya streak to define um, kilted flow homology by an algebraic formula similar to this. Okay, okay, great. Um, and I see that there's a question also from Octave Cornea. Okay. Um, All right, so uh, somewhat of the same question. So the squiggly line is in the domain of the disk? Squiggly line is yeah. So you you have one one curve going from the base point to x, another one going from y to the base point. So that's all good. Yeah. And then you have another one that goes through the disk, right? Yeah. So the disk is, is a holomorphic map, right? Yeah. No. Just a sec. So you have the domain and you the domain of the polygon, and you pick a line between the input to the output in the domain. Is this correct? And then you take the image of this line through the holomorphic map. Yes. And then you concatenate with uh, two other paths. Is okay. this correct? That's correct. And you pick these lines in such a way that's compatible with gluing and uh, bubbling off. It's, it's, you know, I didn't actually pick the line. Uh, you know, it's just the homotopy class that matters. Okay. But yes, if yeah, yes, if you were trying to do something. Something All right. okay to me. because you only look at the end that it's class in H1, so it doesn't really matter the exact yeah. line, right? Yeah. That's actually why I drove in squiggly way, otherwise, I've driven straight way. But <laughs> okay, all right, thank you very much. I, I got it, thanks. Okay, so I claim this is an action, right? A local action, and actually, let me just say something else here. It's a corollary of this lemma here. Okay, so you may want to see something more geometric. Okay, HF y to the L, M gamma alpha, M kappa alpha, so lambda alpha, tensored with this guy. By lemma is the same as H phi to the T tensored with uh, this fault here. And this isomorphic to fluoromology group I just wrote. HFL prime phi to the TL for small t, of course. And, you know, when I say it's a local action, what I mean by this is the following. So the convolution is analog, like, you know, the bimodules, I said, are just more the transformations, they're generalizations of functors on categories. And the convolution is the analog of composition. And when you compose two of these folks, they behave in the expected way for small t1 and t1, t2. I mean, you can actually deduce this from the lemma, but, I have a different argument for this, which I won't be able to tell today. That works when we are talking about the periodic periodics as well. Okay. Which 
I'm about to talk now. So, no. Um, I will very briefly remind uh, you what's what's up with Kedix. Sorry, doesn't mean anything. Sorry, review of Kedix. So, QP is the completion of Q with respect to the periodic norm. It's a normed field. And the periodic norm is defined as P to the negative wall PX. So wall PX counts how many P's are in a fractional expression of X. The ones in the bottom part count as negative. Okay. And ZP is, you can see this as closure of Z inside QP, of course. You can see this as the unit disk. Or you can write this, you know, if you are introducing this word first, and we can think of this as the series, the powers of P, where these folks are all integers. And since it's a normed field, you can actually do analytic geometry over QP. So I like this symplectic geometry's take on analytic, non-Archimedean analytic geometry and do it without actually knowing what's backward spectrum, etc. So don't worry, you don't have to know either. I, no, nobody here, no, no, I think I have some, let, let, me, let me not say anything else. Okay, so the upshot is you can do analytic geometry over QP and I will denote the closed unit disk by D1. It's a little slow to say this, but I, the QP points of this are identified with ZP. Then there's a ring of analytic functions. On D1, you can define this a series with some explicit convergence condition. So this is like closed disk of radius p to the negative n you can identify it with z p to the n z p and this is you know if you if you change this, if by a change of parameter in this first ring here you get analytic functions on the small disk, dp to the negative n. Okay. So as I said, I'm somehow imitating Bell's proof. So I will start by reducing field of definition. Of category. And you know, I think Paul has some work on reducing the field of definition for Calabria hypersurfaces, but this is a lot simpler than that. So, you know, this is one instance, although not the most important one, that you use bohr sommerfeld monotonistic. The A infinity coefficients are finite sums. Of this form, right? And the energy belongs to some finitely generated group inside the reals. Okay, let G be an additive subgroup a subgroup that contain all energies. Okay, then the 
square category is defined over um, the rational functions in t to the g, where t to the g belong to, like t to the power t to the powers that belong to g. Okay, and since okay, let's just say g is finitely generated. And then you can write G as span of independent elements. And yeah, Foucault category is defined over this ring and this field, sorry, and this field is also purely transcendental extension. It can be written in this way. So this folks are algebraically independent. So I will denote this by by this notation. And for reasons that you will see in a second, I also assume G contains the first homology, uh, not the first homology, the periods of alpha. Okay. So any embedding of the field of definition the QP gives a periodic version of Foucault category. It's not canonical, but I really don't need that. Um, and I want a periodic family of pi modules. Questions? Can you see me? Oh. Yeah, I hope I'm still connected. Okay. Um, okay. So to define periodic family, I'll just replace the formulas. If you remember, we had something like this. T to the alpha partial h u partial h h is for half by the way it's like half of the boundary of u um okay so i will apply the coefficients of the bimodule this embedding mu the first term becomes this thing. The numbers doesn't change here. And how do you apply? Sorry, there's a T here. T is a parameter, okay? Okay, so. I apply mu to this term, t to the alpha, and then I take its t to power. Okay, what does it mean? Uh, so this is a periodic number. And I actually, construct the embedding so that it's actually one more p. So, sorry, I should change the color. Poonen and Bell constructs a simple version of periodic exponentiation, like a periodic interpolation. That if you have an element here, that's one mod P, then you define an analytic function where t is the parameter here, okay? So this red term means this. And, you know, I, I'm a little short of time, so I'm not going to say much more about this, but... Mm, so you get a family 
parameterized by d1. And let's just denote this family by m alpha qp. Okay. So same lemma of group likeness hold m alpha qp t1 tensor it's periodic version of the Foucault category is here t2 is same as t1 plus t2 for small t1 and t2 but now but the small means it's pitically small, right? In other words, T1, T2 belong to P2 and ZP for some large N. Okay. And you know, this can be natural numbers that are arbitrarily large. Okay, so Let's say K is a field of definition. Containing these guys over which the one of the modules HL, etc., are defined, etc., etc. I'm not I'm not even claiming this is finite generate, but you know, I still I have an explicit construct that I'm not going to say. Let me just say it contains this first field of definition. I told you and it embeds into QP. So that all these terms, T to the alpha i's, et cetera, map into elements one mod P. So I can define this periodic family. But if I have something like this, I can define M alpha K similar to this first family of bimodules I had. And base change under mu gives me, okay, I'm being a little sloppy here. Can define this guy here for T in ZP intersection Q and the base change, but because of explicit reasons, gives me the restriction of this family of bimodules or periodics restricted to T and base change to lambda gives me the first by family, first by modules that we constructed. So can I take a couple of more minutes maybe? Yeah, uh, two more minutes is fine. No, two is, yeah, I mean, I think, okay, hopefully. I mean, or, or three, you know. Okay, two after, anyway, uh, um, so what I was saying, I, yeah. Okay, so let me state a bunch of corollaries here. If you have, okay, let's just see. Now, I have this base change property and that's how I'm, am I gonna, I'm, I'm gonna relate the periodic family of bimodules to the, you know, the first type of bimodules that I, I construct. So if you have elements here, Let's just denote this by p to the n z sub parenthesis p. Then you can consider first there's no alpha one, that's just alpha. You have this convolution and there's a map, natural map to the right hand side and it base changes to the map that you construct here. So it, it, it's a quasi isomorphism. And if you base change in the other direction, you will get this. So this is important because it's actually telling you that even if T1 and T2 are not small, as long as they're periodically small, this family is group-like. Okay. So that's not trivial. And another corollary, well, corollary of corollary, I think, 
if t is in here, p to the n q, then h l uh, alpha t is the same as this guy. It's the same claim, but now t can be large. And I am already about to go over them, so proof is somehow skipped. So the proof is, you know, you have L here, you have phi to the L, alpha L here, you subdivide this into small intervals that are all in here. Okay, and then you apply the previous corollary. And corollary of the corollary of the corollary is, well, okay, maybe not, uh, it's not cool. You can recover the rank of the fuller homology, L phi to the T alpha L prime, which I said for homological reasons is the same as this guy here. Uh, as the rank over PDX, as the rank of H star. Okay, so this one is the PDX version. Uh, this is true for, again, T is possibly large in real topology, but it may be PDX small. It, it's when it's PDX small. And you know this is just it's not completely true, but this is this rank can be recovered from the rank of the stalks of something here. So you know, as I'm restricting to only this t, it gives me it gives me a coherency over the unit disk, and it gives me a coherency over the small unit disk, but I can recover as the stalks. And it's a fact, you can, you can relate to complex analytic geometry as well, coherent analytic shifts over a curve, over a, you know, over D to the shifts over D something, let's see, are free with finite many exceptions, have rank constant, with finitely many exceptions. Exceptions, I'm about to be done. Sorry for not, not quite that, almost done. Okay, so this implies rank of this guy here is constant in here, constant in K that belong to here. And you know that does not what I claimed, it, that you can replace L prime by phi to the I L prime. There are finite minimum modulo classes P to the N, right? You can replace by other things, get this rank to be periodic with finite domain exceptions. And I had no constraint on prime, so I can replace this by a power of another prime. So it's also P prime to the N prime periodic, but you know, those are co-prime, so it means the period is one actually, rank is constant with finite many exceptions. Yeah. And I apologize for going over time and that. Um... Okay, let's give Brish a hand. Any questions for Brish? <clears throat> uh, may I ask a question? 
Uh, this property is that this for T1 and T2, that the tensor product is T1 plus T2. Yes. And are there any examples that this doesn't hold for big T1 and T2? In this setting? Yes. I think no. I think that actually holds. I think that should be holding generality, right? At least in the monotone case. Yes, yes. Although the way I can think of how to prove it without PDX involves a lot of homological algebra, like com comparing the deformation classes of both sides. Yeah. But you know, so something one can prove is that if you consider this geometric composition of the correspondence, mm -hmm. that coincides, right? Geometric composition of the correspondence. Sure, sure. Yeah, but... and, and, and the theorem, general theorem says that in that case, is that these two compositions are isomorphic up to some choice of a bounding cochain. Yes, yes, but I mean, I'm not- And the monotone yeah. case, it seems likely this, this deformation is trivial. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I mean, I, 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 I didn't see carefully, but it, it might be that kind of argument might be possible. Maybe, but I mean, here I'm actually defining this in an algebraic way. It's more like, you know, uh, you know, for instance, you can define the deformations of a Lagrange, like of, a, of the Yoneda module of a Lagrangian in a very similar way. By just weighting every disk, yeah. while taking the class of the boundary on L into account as well, mm -hmm. and that is true only for small time, right? Yeah. In large time, for instance, you may get new intersection points, some intersection points. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the fact that this uh, changes just correspond to this change of weight holds only for small p. That's I agree. Yeah, so it's like this statement is somehow. Not the statement, but this geometrist statement is somehow a kilted flow homology version of that. Basically. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, sorry, I couldn't really say. No, I mean, I, what I'm trying to say is, you know, yes, the geometric, sorry, the geometric composition uh, of the Lagrangians corresponding to phi to the t1 and phi to the t2 always agree. Yes. But this algebraic formula doesn't always give you the pi module corresponding to this Lagrangian, these graphs yes. for large t. Yes, of course. That's what I was trying to say. So the only way I can think of how to prove this is, you know, there's an explicit map that's also constructed using, you know, using similar counts, you weight using this class and this class here, and it has a Cone. Yeah. So by computing its deformation class, uh, we can show that it follows some Hochschild cohomology class. So this is still work in progress, but, and it vanishes at T1 equals T2 equals zero. So it's like, you know. I think that this geometric composition corresponds to this algebraic compositions. In the monotone case, is proved by that a kind of diagram, maybe uh, Letty and Letyansky? No, but they are still they still have e explicit Lagrangians, right? No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. So this, I, mean, this, I, mean, I, 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 I don't know, but it's, I, I know some papers about this kind of things. How this geometric composition corresponds to algebraic compositions, and if you remove these monotonistic conditions, it, it doesn't so much simple. I see. I didn't think so carefully how this monotonicity restricts. I, 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 it seems likely that then this kind of deformation by bounding chain never appears for this monotone case. Uh -huh. that, I see. And how do you show this? Oops. I think basically using this, uh, this y, y, y diagram. Okay. No, but yeah, I mean, like, I, as far as I remember, Lekin Lipiansky showed this for geometric composition, but for bounding coachings, I mean, like, I'll do I, mean, I, I know some papers, including this bounding cochains. Mm -hmm. That paper does not contain the kind of what this particular situation of monotone case implies. So I cannot say anything uh, uh, precise now, but it might be a case we can just use this monotonicity. Mm -hmm. I see. Thanks. Rich, you have a question from Yunjay No. Uh, Yunjay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, good question. I can see it actually. I okay. check why initial action is defined only for small t. I mean, it's actually defined for all t. It's not. It's just not immediately geometric. 
right? In this monotone case, the sums are finite. If we were in non-monotone case, they will be infinite sums. And then it wouldn't be defined. I think I lost it, but ah, yeah. So those sums are finite. So it's actually defined for ah, here. Defined for all t. But it just doesn't have any geometric immediate geometric meaning. I don't know if that answers your question. Breach, I wanted to ask. Um, do you, and I may have missed it, do you get an explicit handle? Do you actually identify what the exceptions are? No, I don't think so. I have, I don't think I can. The first example, for instance, examples I like this third example I gave, because we produce, for instance, connected like branches, but the exception is two. There are two exceptional exceptions. But you know, we can actually use the same idea to pass to like higher and higher products so that the exceptional can be arbitrarily large. Your microphone just started breaking up. Maybe that will uh, So, okay, let me just repeat again. Um, I, uh, so you can, you're using a similar idea to taking this product, you can consider products of, for instance, hygiene, hygiene services to construct examples where the set of exceptions is arbitrarily large. So I don't think I can you know, put my hand on how to, I, I can, I don't think I can control the set of exceptions. Oh, I mean, I didn't mean control. I just meant like given a, a particular V and M and L, um, like explicitly identify what or predict what they are ahead of time. Um, but anyway, it sounds like the answer is no. Yeah, I don't think I can do that. It's an interesting question. For instance, is there a bound that you can put on the set of finite set of ex exceptions? Well, I don't think I can do that. It's an interesting question. Thanks. Okay, uh, any more questions for Arish? Yes, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so Barish, where do you use the smoothness of the category? That's very implicit in several different places. For instance, um, for instance, when you are taking these convolutions, so not then taking convolutions, then you take these convolutions here, okay? Uh, the convolution can be pretty bad in general. Like it doesn't have to be perfect, but you know, this, and you know, even this family of, even these biomodules here are not a priori perfect. But if you have smoothness, since these biomodules are all proper by definition, you can actually use this to show their perfectness. And the same goes on the left-hand side here. And you know, I'm using a semi-continuity argument here. So I actually use, for instance, the self-homes of these biomodules to be finite dimensional. Yes. Yeah, so that's where you basically, I mean, like without smoothness, you don't have that. All right, thanks. Yeah, and also I'm using finite, gener finite generability as well. I mean, like for instance, when you're trying to put a control over the set of possible energies. Right, right. But I mean, like these two properties are the most crucial places where smoothness are used. Not this two properties, like the perfectness of this uh, biomodules or their cone. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, let's give Brish another hand. Great. Well, thank you, Barish. Um, if people had questions they wanted to ask uh, in a more informal setting, and Barish, if you'd like to, um, you're welcome to stay on the call. Sure, I can stay. Uh, Baris, uh, if I can ask a question. Sure. I forgot to ask it before. Uh, so um, intuitively, is this uh, what you do could it be looked at like in the following way that you have two Lagrangians L and L prime? Yeah. And then you start to move uh, L by uh, phi K. Yeah. And uh, in this category, you can express any Lagrangian in terms of uh, the generators L1 up to. Uh, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And 
you start by expressing L in a certain shape, and then you re-express phi of L and phi two of L and so on. Yeah. And the moments when you have a jump in the ranks is the moments where the cone, or in any case, the expression of the phi K of L uh, changes. Mm -hmm. Because you know the, the structure, of course, of the decomposition of IK of L in terms of the generators, in principle, changes from one K to the other, right? Yes. yes. Um, interesting comment. This. I think, you know, even without the change of shape, you can have rank jumps. So. So my, my point is, uh, in principle, that the rank you would expect it to be associated to, you know, you look to all the generators, you intersect them with L prime, and mm -hmm. there is some spectral sequence. It's gonna give you the rank of whatever you write in terms of the LIs mm -hmm. and intersect with L prime. Yeah. And somehow what you expect is that the rank can jump when, there are some modifications in the expression of the decomposition, you see. So basically there are some actions that change when you have very little movement, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but no necessarily new intersection points and so on. Yeah, I think rank jumps again, like can happen even when you move a little bit without producing any new intersection points. Maybe I'm just misunderstanding that. Yeah, oh, no, of course. But what I mean is that if uh, say, uh, you know, like in your example, I think the first example you gave, so uh, you, you start with two LL primes that are disjoint. So if you move a little bit L, they're still gonna be disjoint. Yes. Um, so, uh, so basically this is viewed by, if you decompose L, in terms of the basis, uh, the fact that it was disjoint before, it's gonna be seen homologically by the homology of the, right? Mm -hmm. And then you start to move it and the expectation is that at some moment the expression you have will uh, be different in terms of this uh, sort of generators. So what I'm saying is, suppose you write L as a cone, I don't know, of a certain map from L1 to L2, and uh, the result maybe another cone to L3. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after a certain moment, maybe you'll have uh, a cone from L2 to L3, and that's it, as uh, representing mm -hmm. phi 3, I don't know. Yeah, so I think that's actually going to be the case in general, even in the Calabria case for elliptic curves, etc. It's like, you know, when Mohamed, for instance, was talking about analytic sheaf of lower modes, this is more like a homotopy sheaf, right? You go up to some point, but then, I mean, but like this shape change can happen in uh, other settings as well. But, you know, the shape change doesn't need to imply the change of ranks. And similarly, yeah, similarly, the change of ranks doesn't need to be co caused by the shape changes. Okay. Maybe I didn't really. It's like, you know, if you have a chain complex, if you deform the differential, if you have a cyclic complex, even if under some, even if you deform the differential without changing the complex itself, it may stop being a cyclic. Okay, well, uh, I, I, I don't know. Maybe I, uh, I didn't read that. <laughs> because if I write a complex in terms of generators, it's fixed. Uh, I have a fixed uh, rank of intersection with this, L prime, which is also fixed. Yeah. And so so it's, like, you know, it's like the simplest example of, uh, you know, when you have some cylinder like this, when the area is the same here, when you deform, deformed a little bit, the areas become different and the differential becomes non-zero, right? So it becomes somehow, the complex becomes a signal. Right. I agree that it's an issue of uh, uh, area separation, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, any case, okay, thanks. So I, I, I was curious if you looked at it this way. Okay, thanks, thanks for the comment.
This is still being recorded. I'm afraid to say anything. It looks like the recording's still on. Yeah.